Hello and welcome to lesson 10.1 in the Alice tutorial series. Today we're going to be talking about looping. Uh, us using the loop statement is something that you may have played around with already. Uh, it's certainly come into play in a few of the programs that we've done thus far, although we've chosen not to use it because we're focusing on other concepts. Today we're going to look at how to use the loop command to do animations that are going to be repetitive so that if you have to make adjustments to your code, you only have to do it one time instead of multiple times like we've done with uh, say copying and pasting walking animations. Now looping by itself is a pretty useful programming technique but it becomes infinitely more powerful when we start writing interactive programs. If we were to make a helicopter simulator or a driving simulator or first person shooters learning how to use these loops is super important. So let's go ahead and get started with the introduction to looping commands. So I've got my new Alice world open here and just like we did in one of the previous lessons let's go ahead and add an object and we're gonna add a simple people object. So select people and we're gonna add the coach. Now we could choose any number of people but I like the coach for simplicity because his legs don't have joints at the knees because what we're gonna do is create a real simple walking animation again. So go ahead and position your coach as you've done in the past by lowering his arms to his side and kind of giving him a more natural standing position. So rotate the object, use your turn object forward and backwards button and affect subparts. And now we've got a standing coach. Let's make sure he looks okay. Perfect. Now, like we've done in the past, I'm going to position the coach over here on the left hand side and we're going to have him walk across the screen from right to left. And in order to have the coach take his first step, we're going to code in to have the coach and we're just going to have his right leg turn backwards. And I think the value that I like is 0.15, though I don't quite remember. So let's try that coach turn backwards 0.15 revolution and have his right leg at the same time or his left leg excuse me turn forward 0.15 revolutions and let's take a look at what that looks like uh, might be a little bit too much so let's go ahead and kick this down to 0.1 see if that looks any better as well as throw this into a do together loop so that both the legs move at the same time and test that code out again. Perfect. That looks about right. Now the finishing touch is just to have the coach move forward. So I'll have the entire coach move forward by 0.1 meters. And that might be a little bit too short. So let's go ahead and try that. Let's double that and use 0.2 meters. hit play, and that's probably about right. So we've done that in the previous video. Now we're going to double up on these. So we're going to have the coach move forward four meters. So coach move forward 0.4 meters. Meanwhile, have his right leg. So let's select his right leg, which originally turned backwards. So we're going to have that turn forward 0.2 revolutions. I mean, essentially, we're going to take this 0.1 revolution and double it so that he's it's moving back to its original position plus another 0.1 meters. It's the same reason we doubled the distance. Let's use his left leg. We're going to turn that backwards. And we're going to turn that backwards 0.2 revolutions as well. So let's go ahead and test this before we add any more code. So you get the first step and the second step. And the second step looks pretty good. Now, one more time, I I'm, I'm need to have the full walking animation. So let's have the coach move forward 0.4 meters and have the legs do a full return back to the, the start of the walking animation. So the right leg is going to turn backwards 0.2 revolutions and the left leg is going to turn forwards 0.2 revolutions. 
And let's see how this animation looks at this point. Okay. It looks to be okay. Now what we want to do is we want to use the loop command so that instead of copying and pasting these blocks of code as we've done in the past, we want to make this as efficient as possible. I'm going to add a loop command between the start of the animation and the end of the animation. And let's just set it to five times for right now. So that means that whatever is in this block is going to happen five times. It'll run the code from top to bottom, and then when it's done, go back up to the top and run it again however many times you set. So I'm going to take the walking animation, both steps, and put this into the loop. Now when I hit play, I should get five steps out of the coach with only one instruction in that loop. By doing so, I can set the number of steps that I want my coach to take. It becomes really easy then to say the coach has walked too far. Let's go ahead and scale this back to three times. So select other and three. Hit play and now the coach will only take three full steps and a full step being the right leg forward all the way to the back position then all the way to the front again. Looping is a great way to make sure that you're not changing a bunch of code. In the past, when I've done my walking animations, I've done so by copying and pasting. But what happens is, if I copy and paste my code, and I have the same block that appears four or five times during the course of my program, if I decide that I don't want the coach walking forward 0.4 meters, then I think 0.5 works better. I then have to go find every single occurrence of this 0.4 meters and adjust it. By using the loop command, any changes that I make will just be repeated. So now that we've taken a look at how to use the loop command for something like a simple walking animation, let's start a new world and head over to the amusement park gallery where we're going to use the same technique to do some animations with some of the amusement park objects. So in this new world, I'm going to click on add objects, go back to the local gallery, and let's pick out an amusement park object. And this time, I think what I'm looking for is the octopus. So grab the octopus, put him in your scene, and he's a rather large object. So I'm going to raise the camera up, back it off a little bit, and tilt it so I have a good view of this in my viewing window. So I'm going to animate the octopus, and I don't know if we'll do a real detailed animation for this, but let's go ahead and tell the octopus and what we want the body to do is we want the body to turn to the right. And normally what we do, would do is say one revolution over a duration of say 10 seconds. And when that line, is, line of code is run, we get the object turning one time by 10 seconds. And that's pretty much what you'd expect. We're going to add a loop command. And when you start doing interactive projects, that is, projects that use user input to guide the program and what to do. The user's pressing up and down and left and right and clicking on stuff. Sometimes what you have to do is use a loop command, but you have to do really small uh, increments. Right now we have the body of the octopus turning one revolution every 10 seconds. Now if I were to take this and loop this 10 times, of course you'd get 10 revolutions over the course of how uh, it was 100 seconds because this would run one revolution every 10 seconds and then loop it 10 times. So you won't see a huge difference in the animation here except for there will kind of be a little bit of a pause after every full rotation where the octopus will come to a stop and then start up again. But that's not really what we want. What we want to do is instead of having the octopus turn right one revolution, we want him to turn right 0.1 revolutions. And we want the 0.1 revolutions to occur over a period of one second. Now the end result is going to be the same. If we go 10% of a revolution 10 times, we still end with 100% of a revolution. And if each one-tenth of a revolution takes one second, the whole animation will take 10 seconds. If we hit play, we can kind of see that running. The only difference is you're, you're getting a little bit of a herky-jerky motion, 
And that's because of the style of the animation. Right now we have the animation set to gently and we want to change this to abruptly. So select style, abruptly, and then hit play. And we'll see that the octopus is still doing a full rotation over 10 seconds, but we've done it with much smaller numbers looped many times. As you start programming with events, it becomes important because if you have every event take one full second or 10 full seconds, when the user lets go of a key or the user presses a key, the, a key, the animation might take a full second. Now, if you think about a walking animation where you press up on the keyboard and a character starts walking, when you let go of the key, you expect the animation to stop running faster than one second. If every time you let go of a key, the animation continued to run for one full second, it would make operating kind of difficult. This just provides an opportunity for you to practice using these smaller values looped a number of times. Now it might not be super important at this point, but when we get to program interactivity, that'll be an important concept to know. Now to kind of spice up this animation a little bit, what I might want to do is kind of reset all the arms so that they're in the down position. And I can do that in my loop as well. So let's start with arm number one. When I click on arm number one, I can see this is in the raised position. So I want arm number one to turn forward. And right now, let's just try and see what a quarter revolution would look like. Now, my guess is it's gonna be a little bit too far. Actually, quite a lot too far. So when I run this animation, this will definitely go too far because it's gonna turn a quarter revolution every single tick and it will run 10 times, which means it will end up turning around two and a half times. So when I hit play, this doesn't quite look right. In fact, it looks pretty darn awful. What I wanna do is I want to find a, a value for that arm that moves it to kind of the down position to match all these other arms that are already in the down position. Now 0.25 was way too far, so let's go ahead and try 0.1. So select other and hit 0.1. In order to see where this ends up, I'm going to turn my loop down to one time as well. Once I know how far I have to go, I can kick that loop back up to where it was. So I hit play, and that arm moves to the down position. And that looks about right. Since I know that the final revolution has to be 0.1, and I know I'm looping this 10 times, instead of turning it forward 0.1 revolutions, I'm going to turn it forward 0 0.01 revolution, or one-tenth of where I want it to end up. Just like I did with the other animation, I'll make sure that the duration is set to one second, and the style is set to abruptly so that it doesn't have kind of that jerky animation motion. With this line of code in there, I should see that over the course of the revolution, that arm will drop. Now one thing that I didn't do that's causing this animation to look really not fluid is that the octopus body and the octus, octopus arm aren't moving at the same time, they're moving one after another. So let's fix that by adding a do together loop and putting both of these into a do together loop and hit play. And I can see that that arm is slowly lowering as the animation plays. Since that's the effect that I want, I'm gonna go ahead and move all the other arms down to the lower position as well, so that at the end of this animation, all the arms are down. So when I click on two, I can see two is already in the down position. Arm three is not. So let's have arm three turn forward, 0 0.01 revolutions over the duration of one second and an abrupt style. Hit play, and let's try this out. And both of those arms are now lowering at the same time. And I can repeat this process for arm number five. Turn forward 0.01 revolutions over one second abruptly. And then I think it's arm number seven that I'm going for here. Yep, that looks about right. Arm seven, turn forward. 0 0.01 revolution, one second, and style abruptly. 
So what I've got now is all the arms should be lowering as this octopus makes its final revolution. And that could be my ride kind of coming to a stop here. And maybe I want to move these other arms down as well, because they look to be a little bit higher. So we can play around with this animation, but the point is by using this loop, we're cutting this animation down into very small pieces. And when you have a loop that runs 10 times, you just divide all of your desired animations by 10. So if you have an animation that runs 10 seconds, you can loop it 10 times with one second and then take the amount that things are moving and divide it by 10 as well. Again, it may seem incredibly inefficient to do things this way when you could simply write the animation, loop it once with all the correct numbers. But as we get into more interactive programs, you'll find the smaller the number, the better. And we're going to go ahead and practice this in a challenge program. Now, it would be really easy to cheat on this challenge program and just make an animation that looks correct. But what you're going to do when you take a look at the challenge program, try and use smaller numbers. Instead of having a single animation, and I'll show you what we're doing in just a second, you're going to be trying to do this in a loop that runs one-tenth of an animation every click. So let's go ahead and get started with the Lesson 10.1 Challenge Program. for your lesson 10.1 challenge program I have reloaded uh, a car scene that we did from uh, back when we did camera panning I think that was lesson 8.3 or somewhere around there but um, what I've done is I've converted this car to run on a loop and in particular I've I've got the animation running on a really short loop so I've got the code hidden here at the bottom but you can see right now I have to loop one time and when I hit play the car does drive forward, but just for a brief second. In fact, it only drives forward a half a meter over the course of one second. I can now adjust how far my car drives simply by adjusting my loop time. So if I take the loop and have it run 10 times, I'll see that the car will drive a lot further than if I have it only looping one time. Your goal in the Lesson 10.1 Challenge program is to recreate an animation in which a car is driving down the road. Now you can reuse the one from earlier if you've done this one or you can kind of come up with your own and make a new scene but your goal is to make a car that runs on loops. That means it's got to move forward a realistic distance, the wheels have to roll, and it has to move in small segments. I think I used a move forward half a meter and I think the wheels are moving forward maybe 0.15 revolutions somewhere around there but you'll have to play around with it and see how it works. Now I can even uh, go a little bit further and adjust the duration of some of these arguments and by adjusting the duration I can make the car appear to drive even a little bit faster. Let me pause the video real quick and show you what I mean. Okay, I've made some quick adjustments to my program, and really all I did was change the duration of each of these animations to half a second instead of one full second. When I run this animation now, you can see the car is driving exactly twice as fast as it was. But everything is still in scale because I adjusted the time for every animation. I could make the car now drive as fast or as slow as I want just by adjusting some simple uh, arguments in my program. When you write programs like this, you make it really easy to adjust the animation by changing to simple numbers instead of having to reprogram an entire animation every time you want to make a slight change. So good luck with the Lesson 10.1 Challenge Program, animating your car to drive down the road using the loop command. As always, if you have any problems with it, if you have any questions, you're definitely welcome to leave those questions in the comments and I'll help you out any way that I can so that we can make sure you get your programs working. Thank you so much for watching the Alice tutorial series and look forward to seeing you next time.